I want you to be sure you are in faith or you are playing games with God. There are some things we do as Christians, we might not know that we are just joking. And we think it is spiritual or we think we are having faith, but we are just playing games. On Wednesday, I spoke about what it means to be spiritual. I spoke about spirituality 101. So I am teaching on the same line of thoughts. Sunday and Wednesday, I will finish this up this coming Wednesday. In my observation as a Christian, I have come across 10 games people play with God and they make it look like they are very spectacular. But if you ask me, they are games. And I will list as many as I can before the time is up and explain that. And if I don't finish, I will talk about it in the concluding part on Wednesday. Are you ready for this? Games Christians play with God. Number one, making God a promise to get something. Making God a promise to get something. Making God a promise to get something from him. When you say, God, if you will give me this, I will give you this. If you do that, you are not operating under the new covenant. God, if you give me so and so, I will give you so and so. When you do that, you are now in a transaction. Christianity stopped being a transaction on the cross. Everything we get in Christendom is by grace. Come on, say grace. It is no longer conditional. Let me show you this. I was teaching them on Wednesday. Matthew 6, 33, put it up and be fast this morning. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? And what will happen? And his righteousness, thank you. And what? All these things shall be what? Now, is there a condition? You are not in church. Is there a condition for all these things to be added? So for all these things to be added, what is the condition? Seek ye first. That is how it is in the Old Testament. Pastor, is Matthew Old Testament? Yes. Because Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of many. Until Jesus shed his blood, the Old Testament had not ended. Are you with me, please? A testament is a will. If you die without a will, you died in testate. So the New Testament or the New Covenant began after Jesus died and resurrected. So what you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his humanity, all right, is still under Old Testament. Even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is in the New Testament of your Bible, he's still under Old Testament. New Testament actually begins from Acts. So in the Old Testament, God gives a condition. And you must understand that he's giving them a condition to show them that they cannot meet any condition for him to bless them. But they were not getting the point. So in the Old Testament, seek ye first the kingdom. All these things shall be added. Go to New Testament. First Peter 1 verse 3. New Testament is telling you, is it first or second Peter now? Be fast, please. He's saying there is no condition. According as his divine power has what? How many things? Before it was, seek ye first the kingdom and all things shall be what? Added. Now, there is no condition. His divine power has already given unto us all things. What is going on here? Grace. Are you seeing? Meaning that as believers in the New Testament, God does not give us a condition for him to do something for us. Are you here? God does not... Every good and perfect gift comes from above. God does not give a condition for him to do something for the believer. So, trying to make God a promise such that he can do for you what you think you want is ignorance. It now becomes works. It now becomes transaction. Exodus 19, verse 5 to 6. Exodus 19, 5 to 6. 
You can see the Old Testament full of conditions. Now, if you will obey my voice, if you will keep my covenant, you shall be what? A peculiar treasure unto me, right? Above all people, for all the earth is mine. Next verse. And you will be unto me a kingdom of what? Priests. And they will talk to me. Holy nation. He was telling them, you will be unto God a kingdom of priests. You will be unto God a holy nation. All right? A peculiar treasure. If. What does if mean? Condition. If you will obey my voice. But look at New Testament. First Peter 2 verse 9. No conditions anymore. First Peter 2 verse 9. Boy, you are. You are already. Why he said, if you will do this, you will be unto me a kingdom of priests. But you are already a royal priesthood. He said in Old Testament, if you obey my voice, you will be unto me a holy nation. But you are now a holy nation. He said there, if you obey my voice, you will be unto me a treasured people. Now we saying in New Testament, you are already. Are you here? The conditions of the Old Testament have all been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So God is no longer waiting for a condition to bless you. Ignorance is when you tell God, God, if you do this for me, I will do this. You know, people are reading the Old Testament. And, and, and it is good, but in the month of September, we'll go back to Bible basics. The first one is that we'll be talking about how to rightly divide the word of truth. You read the book of Samuel. You see where Hannah says, God, if you give me a man child, I will give him back to you all the days of my life. If you will, don't you ever relate to God with an if. I'm preaching now. God does not respond anymore to if. So when you see that, people are copying that. Not knowing that these things are written for our learning. Not for our doing. Are you still there? And they are, they are making God promises for mundane things. For mundane things like having a man-child. If you give me a man child, I will do this, I will do that. No, 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 no. New Testament, Galatians 3 28, in Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female. So, anyone he gives you, all right, is what you get. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Your promise to God does not make him act faster. If someone tells you, and I promise God I will do this, and it's happened, thank God for you, but that wasn't God. In the New Testament, if God were to respond to you because of the promise you have made to him, then his integrity depends on your faithfulness. But rather, you depend on God's integrity. You depend on God's faithfulness. We are the variable. God is always constant. You don't need to mobilize God for him to act. You don't need to make God happy for him to be in your favor. You don't need to provoke God for him to do what he wants to do. In the New Testament, we are those who believe that he has already done it all. Are you following what I'm saying? And then we are receiving what he has already done in eternity. We are receiving it in time. Are you following what I'm saying? It is only God that makes man promise. Man is too small to make God a promise. And by the way, if you check all through the scripture, the only promise that God made to man is the promise of his Holy Spirit and the promise of Christ. Acts 2 verse 23. Acts 2 verse 23, please. Acts 2 33, please. 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, being, therefore being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father, the word, talk to me, the promise of the Holy Ghost. So the promise God made mankind is that after Christ comes, there will be a Holy Ghost. Are you there? Okay, 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 25. 1 John 2, 25. And this is the promise that he has promised us. What is that promise? Are you seeing? 
And where is eternal life? Go to chapter 5. Chapter 5. Look at verse 11. This is the record that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. So what did God promise man? Eternal life for those who believe in him. And then to show that he will keep his promise in the age to come, he gave us a past payment for the now. What is that past payment? The Holy Ghost. So while we are still here, the Holy Ghost becomes our seal that we have been bought already. You know when you make past payments or something, nobody can buy it anymore. So the Holy Ghost he has given us becomes our seal that he has paid a price on us. Our seal that he will come back or he will appear. Remember last week? And then receive us unto himself and gifts us all right, eternal life. I feel what I'm saying. God has made his promise to men. As is to believe in him, not to make him a promise. Are you with me? When you try to make God a promise, it might make you feel spiritual. But actually, you are not, in, you are not consistent with the teachings of the New Testament. Number two, games Christians play with God, making a covenant or vow with God. It looks like, number one, trying to make a vow to God or making a covenant with God. People, see... If you do that, you didn't know up until now. And you should stop. Are you listening to what I'm teaching? Oh, what I'm teaching you now is not common. It's a message to the body of Christ. You know, <laughs> the Bible says, Romans 15:4, the things which are written are for time, are written for our words. Learning. Say learning. The things which are written at full time are written for our learning. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scripture, might have hope. The word scripture in the Bible means Old Testament. Are you with me? That's the script. So the things that we are written there, they are written for our learning, not for our doing. God does not make a covenant with man. Man makes a covenant with man. The covenant between God and man was only with one man. That man was Christ Jesus. Did you see the two, the bride and groom, just now exchanging vows? Talk to me. Did the husband make a covenant with his child to come? Did the wife make a covenant with his child to come? But when they give birth, will they cater for their child? Will they be nice to their child? Why are they doing that? Is it because they made a covenant with their child? But because they made a covenant with each other. Christians are the beneficiaries of the covenants God made with Christ. We are not the ones that have the covenants with Christ. We are the beneficiaries as is to receive the benefits of that covenant. Are you with me? Somebody, God, I will not commit fornication. If I commit fornication, kill me. And when you say that, it sounds spiritual. Then one day you will catch yourself that you have done it. And you are waiting for God to come and kill you. He will not show up. You know why? He never listens to you. Because you are not the one to make a covenant with him. But when you believe in the grace of Christ Jesus, Titus 2.11 says that grace is a teacher. The grace of God teaches us to live above those things. Are you with me? So, so you are not depending on your good works. But when you believe in grace, the grace of God teaches us that we can live above all things. Jude one twenty four Unto him that is able to keep us from falling. So instead of me making a covenant with God, hoping that that will make me not fall, rather I believe in him because he is able to keep me. It is safer here. Are you there? He's able to keep me from falling. He's able to keep me from falling. He's able to keep me from falling. Don't make rash vows to God. 
A man said, I, I made a covenant with God that my wife will not give birth through CS. And the wife was in a desk, you know, in a critical condition. The doctors told him, he said, I have a covenant with God. And long and short of it, she died trying to push. How does that paint God? God must be wicked then. You know what just happened? And that's why you don't just marry anybody. He looks so spiritual. Listen, listen. You, it's safer to marry someone who has the same doctrinal beliefs as you are. Are you with me? You can't be in this church and you marry somebody who believes that any fly that passes is a devil. Are you with me? There will already be problems. Are you there? It's not just that we are both Christians. Okay, we are both Christians, it's not enough. I can't be speaking in tongues and my wife is in hell, maybe. You get what I'm saying? We'll confuse our children. Are you following what I'm teaching you? So, so you must understand, all right? You must understand. Now, how can somebody die as a result of your own covenant with God? Is that not selfish? If you will not be the beneficiary of the harm of that covenant, then keep your covenant to yours. You know what I'm saying? People have died because somebody has a covenant not to give blood. In our church, we don't receive blood transfusion. Ignorance is powerful. Because people can die believing what does not exist. He said, ah, the Bible rose that the life of a thing is in the blood. Detone on me. Read the New Testament. When Christ, who is my life, shall appear. Colossians 3, 4. I will appear with him in glory. My life is no longer in just blood. My life is Christ. Are you here? In the book of Judges, chapter 11, verse 30, a man called Jephthah made a rash vow to God. God, if you will deliver me from the children of Ammon, what did he say? Next verse. When I come back, whatsoever cometh forth of my house to meet me when I return in peace shall surely be the Lord's. When I come back, whatever meets me first, I will sacrifice to God as a burnt offering. Was it God as a burnt offering? You know, if you even read from the origin, all this burnt offering, God never really asked people to do it. People just believe there should be something more I should do. We are always trying to do. And it's dangerous when we relate with God like that. Because when it is God, you can never do enough. You better believe in what he has done. When you're always trying to do, you want to shine. You want to be the star. You want to get some credits. But we are saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. When you are working in terms of work, you are trying to do something that will give you credibility for boasting. It becomes outside of the gospel. The end of this story was that his only daughter came out when he came back home after the war. He won the battle. His only daughter came out. So he had to sacrifice her. Now, people are reading this in the Old Testament. And they are trying to practice it in the New... Of course, I know believers. You can't allow your father to do that to you. Okay? No, I'm just saying, you know, you know these girls now, no, don't play with them. A girl who is smoking, you want to sacrifice her, she will beat the father. She will be... <laughs> oh, man. What these girls can do now does not exist. You know? <laughs> now, they are reading the Old Testament and they are trying to practicalize it. No, we read it just now. These things are written for our words, learning, not for our doing. So when you read this story, the, the, the moral of the story should be, ah, I will not vow. You understand? It should not be that, okay, let me not vow my only daughter. I have three sons. You get what I'm saying? All the people in the Old Testament that had a covenant with God, it was a type and a shadow. That the covenants they were having with God in the Old Testament, this was God acting a movie, telling us what shall soon be when his son comes. Are you seeing it? 
those things we are reading, they are types and shadows. They are figurative. Yes, they happened. But they are pointing to the real thing that will soon happen. Because as at then, Christ had not yet come. Are you with me? Abraham was going to have a covenant with God. When God appeared, Abraham fell into a, tra- a, fell into a coma. He slept. You know why? He is a man. God did everything by himself. God had a covenant with himself on behalf of Abraham. It's not the same thing that happened in, the, in, in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let us make man. Did he consult man to make man? Who is the us? Only him is us. He's big enough to be us. So he's consulting himself on your behalf. Let us make man in our own image. God, do you agree with God? Yes. We'll now go ahead. Are you seeing? Man is not in the equation. We are beneficiaries of covenant. Are you following this? Number three is something they call fleeces. F-L-E-E-C-E-S. Fleeces. It was done by a man called Gideon. When you carry out fleeces, you know, fleeces is like the woolly part of a sheep. All right, Gideon told God, if you know you will give me success in this battle I'm going for, let fire consume this fleece. That story is in Judges 6. All right, and it happened and all of that. And people now use it today. After praying for who they want to marry, they say, God, if Sister Christiana is the one, let her wear a red shirt while coming to church today. That's called fleeces. When you do that in the New Testament, a mad woman will wear red. <laughs> do you know why? The Bible says God cannot be tempted with evil. James 1.13, let no man say when I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God. For you to be telling God, if this is the one, when I get there, let him not be at home or let him be at home. You are asking God to prove himself. And God does not prove himself. If he has to prove himself, he's not God. You either believe him or you don't. Are you there? Let no man say when he's tempted. I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with what? Stop tempting God. But see the next line. Neither tempted he any man. God too will not tempt you. He won't tell you, for me to do this, I bring this. Let's do that. Do you get all those conditions don't show up. You know why I'm teaching this? This is house of grace. When you have this knowledge, you will take away self-imposed yoke and live a free life of grace. Number four, I hear that a lot. Lawful captive. Somebody says, I was a lawful captive. I am sick because I rejected the call of God. You must be so important. Such that if if you don't answer the call, God will crash. People should stop that. It's not scriptural. It's not Christian. (laughs) There is nothing God is calling you to do that is new, that somebody else cannot do. God can be calling you to do something to new people, but that thing he's calling you to do is not new. The same thing happens in preaching. People go in so error because they are trying to sound different. You want to come out with new rema, new revelation. And actually, if what you are preaching is different, we should be scared of you. Do you know why? Whatever that will ever be preached has been preached. To preach means to announce. So you come and remind these people. So you are telling the same old gospel to a new set of people. Not like the message changed. Are you with me? I did not answer the call of God. And that is why I am like this. I missed it at a point. And so I'm living the rest of my life in this and this. Listen, listen. We can't blame God for things like that. 
Every day you are alive means that God gives you brand new opportunities. Every day you are alive means that God gives you brand new graces. Haven't you read? His mercies are new every morning. As long as you are awake, there are new mercies for you. If something is happening and you are living a terrible life, all right, trust God, but don't make God the object of that. God is not the reason why anybody is sick. God is not the reason why anybody is broke. God is not the reason why there is evil in the world. Everything he made, he said, it was good. Why is there evil in the world? Because those who he has committed the word to teach are not teaching. Or they are teaching something else. I'm just listening out for you things to avoid. Number five, games Christians play with God. Trying to hear an audible voice. Trying to hear an audible voice. Every pastor you listen to, including me, always realize that when they are preaching, their personality comes in between their delivery. You don't get what I'm saying? So I can come and say, and I heard God say, or like somebody said, you see, I heard him on my left ear, I, I was scared. <laughs> now, the point is, the point is, every time I read my Bible, when I have an inward witness, that's God speaking to me. But if all of us want to start waiting to hear audible voices, so people lock their rooms and waiting to hear God, just read your Bible. Every time you flip the page of the Bible, God is speaking. If we are all trying to hear God, we will all become schizophrenics. And I'm telling you, in the middle of the road, you will hear a voice, stop, and the trailer is coming. What I'm trying to say is, when you open up yourself to things like that, you will expose yourself to demonic activities. You must believe that God leads you by his spirit, the inward witness. Are you with me? The way they make it sound, you know, is like, some even uh, God call me by my name. Some say God have a nickname for them, so my name is Chima, he just calls me Chim Chim. Okay. I... <laughs> And you know, when you hear things like that, it only achieves two things for you. When you hear things like that, what it achieves is that, wow, this person is in a higher spiritual state than me. I will never get there. Are you with me? Things like that is not faith. Now, see, am I saying God cannot speak with an audible voice? Yes, he did in the Old Testament. But I can guarantee a believer in this dispensation if you will ever hear an audible voice, it will not be more than twice, probably, in your entire life. Every time God will lead you, he will lead you in two ways. He will speak to you in two ways, by his word and by his spirit. By his word and by his spirit. As I'm speaking now, God is speaking to you. You don't need any extra voice. Because this is why people now tell you, an angel walked into my room and told me this and this and that. And you see, what you don't know is that you are now exposing yourself to the demonic. An angel walks into your room. Listen, listen, listen. Peter says, we saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. As in, we saw Jesus physically. We were with him when the voice came from heaven. He says, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. You know what that means? I heard the voice. I was there with him physically. But the word of God I have is of more credibility than that voice I heard. So if you ever hear any voice, it must be consistent with the New Testament teachings. Whatever you hear that is not consistent with the teaching of the New Testament, it can be discarded. Are you with me? Trust more in the integrity of God's unfailing word than in exposing yourself to voices. You know what Paul said? 
You know what Paul said? Paul said, there are many voices in the world. You can find it for me if you can. He said, there are many voices in the world. You know what that means? If you are waiting to hear voices, you will hear a lot. And so many Christians today are confused. Confused, very confused. Because there are many voices on social media. Everybody now can preach. Everybody is saying different. Everybody is a coach. Everybody is an apostle. Everybody is a pastor. And because you are... The, listen to me. The safest way to hear God's voice, apart from your own personal study and your own personal leading, is to submit to your local pastor. If you want to be led by pastors on social media, you will hurt yourself on many levels. Those who are thinking now as I'm talking, you will be able to see loopholes in some things you have heard online that is contradicted to what I'm teaching you now. I wish I can say it directly, but I will leave that. Number six. Games Christians play with God. Number six. Lying to give a testimony. Who are you trying to impress? My friend told me a story. He said as a child that he was, one day in children's department, he walked away and went to the adult church. And Russia asked him, why are you in my children's department? He said, they are doing little children's thing there. <laughs> and he was probably seven. And he said, because the children's teacher told them that she held an egg that was going to fall, and she shouted, Jesus, the egg fell and it didn't break. Wow. <laughs> That's what people like. Couldn't she have just told them that the egg fell on sand? The egg fell and it didn't break, depending on where it fell. What if it fell on water? Most testimonies are incomplete. If you are led by them, you will be trying to repeat a pattern that will frustrate your own Christian experience. Because it will never work for you and you are wondering. That's why you are supposed to see. If you don't know God for yourself by the word, you, 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 you know how they say, say you are on a long team. Listen, you can't help God. If there is no testimony to give, listen, listen, listen. Don't try to help God. Don't cook up something. And by the way, who told them that testimonies must be dramatic? I was in a bus and the driver tumbled five times. This happened and that happened. I shouted, Jesus, and the thing stopped. All of that. That's a good testimony. But it is a better testimony that I traveled, I came back safely. People just think the testimony is more of a testimony when there is drama. You know how to, you know, you know when, no, that's, that's how we see it. If nothing happened, they don't testify that one. A man called Uzziah in the Old Testament, or Uzzah, sorry, tried to help God, help the ark of God, all right? And the Bible said God killed him. You know why? You, you can't help God, all right? You can't help God. You are, you are making it... <laughs> no. If you actually know who God is, you just spoil the process, the strategy, what he's trying to achieve. Are you with me? We have a lot of testimonies in this church, and we, we receive testimonies. A member of this church last week was on a, on a bus that tumbled. Tumbled, they were dragging all of them out from the window, and she came out with only a scratch on her leg. Are you seeing? Only a scratch. 
In some places, if you hear, it tumbled ten times. I came out, there was no scratch. When you say it as it is, you are giving God more glory. If the pastor prays for you and asks how do you feel, if you don't feel better, I say, I don't feel better. He is not the healer. My time is running. Number how many? Seven. Games Christians play with God. Number seven. Helping the pastor to fall under the anointing. Now I'm shattering tables. Somebody said this pastor. You know, one day, my mother called saw a prayer person to come and pray for us. Pray, you know, like hold a vigil with us. And the man went, there are three people here. The power will come upon you at the count of ten. And when he counted nine, two of my sisters, our relations rather, had already gone down. It was almost ten, and there was no third person. And then my sister, Joyce, Joyce is one kind, you know. She just, she just went, hmm, I opened one eye. I knew. <laughs> no, because we were partners in Christ, so we know each other. Okay. It was almost ten. She went, hmm. <laughs> I knew something was not right here. Because I knew her more than any other person in the world, including our parents. I knew what she was capable of. Okay. She went, hmm. So, later on, okay, one day we were just, and I asked her, ah, that day, when the anointing, you say, I don't have the pastor. Okay. <laughs> so, games, Christians play with God. <laughs> And the problem, the, see, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying people cannot follow the anointing. I have seen that in my own ministry many times. But if you're a pastor listening to this message, now or after now, realize that, that people fall or stand is not a confirmation of your anointing. Don't put yourself under pressure. When you blow on somebody once and the person did not fall, move on. Don't continue over and over. You are expecting a response. And many members now are so used to their pastors. They know what their pastors like. So before he even goes, mm, they go, you understand? That's how the service gets sweet. You know, that's how the service you know, just flows and all of that. See, I'm not saying you can't fall here. You understand what I'm saying? But if you break our camera, the list of them is over 2 million right now. Okay, before you go, you will pay. You understand? You, because, see, can we now start focusing on what happens after people rise up when they fall? Because you can fall and rise up. It doesn't mean anything has changed. So I'm not saying people cannot be impacted. Don't get me wrong. And by the way, that I lay hands on you and you fall doesn't mean I'm powerful extraordinarily. It depends on how you see me. When Michael Jackson sang, people fell. Michael Jackson's clothes fell people. People, girls were crying. I don't know if any Nigerian singer, but for Michael Jackson, okay, they were in tears. You don't cry when you worship. They even fainted. You know why? Michael, all your life you have been dreaming. You know, me and I have seen me finish, so <laughs> you. <laughs> if, maybe, if maybe this was like a church of 50,000 people, maybe I come in from one room there, only three persons can come near me, you understand? You have been wishing to come this close. If I just come here like this, all of you just take it. You know why? You have been dreaming. Ah, if only I might touch the hem of his garments. You know? But now, if I'm passing, say, you could push me the worker. <laughs> so, you have see me finish. <laughs> it, uh, it happened in the Bible now. That's why people were pushing on Jesus. No, God healed. The man with the issue of blood came and touched. It's because of how she was prepped. How she had prepped herself in her mind. You get so I'm saying, someone you, you respect that much, you value and you idolize, when you are in their presence, you understand, you can be overwhelmed. 
Are you with me? Yes, it's an overwhelming. And, and many times, okay, even, even when the Spirit comes on you as it were, the Spirit overwhelmed you. It's not a bad thing, but we are saying it doesn't have to be faked. People don't have to be pushed. We don't have to have, and you know, if you like things like that, Satan will keep you busy. Jewa, I'm sorry, but for some reasons, it's common to girls. There are girls who like stuff like that. So any pastor who, oh, you enjoy things like that, those girls, they will take three hours of your time. They are usually fine girls. I don't know why. You know, when a pastor is preaching and you ask a girl, what's your name? And she says, Osato, you will move on. But when you are preaching and you come to her, what's your name? Say, Queen. Mm. What came to your mind? Queen of the coasts. For some reasons, they are never ugly girls. The queen of the coast must be a fine girl. And then, based on the standing position, by the time he does something and she trips or somebody else trips on her or pushes her, the camera picks on that, and then there is a cataclysmic event because this one pushes somebody else. Listen, it's more than in Christ Jesus, we have all reason. We have reason with Christ. All of those things must not be, they must not be pointers to effective ministry. Are you with me? They must not be aids for you to measure yourself. Are you with me? See, deliverance, right? Am, am, am I teaching? Deliverance is not when, how will I say it now? Deliverance is not when there is manifestation. Deliverance is when people are hearing the word of God and conforming to the image of Christ. You know what the Bible says? He sends forth his word, and his word delivereth them. So, as I am preaching now, and people's mind is changing for the better, and the stronghold of the enemy on their mind is getting loose, you know what that is? Deliverance. It doesn't have to be dramatic. And we don't have to give credit to unfamiliar spirits. If you are with me, snap your fingers. I'm almost done. How many was I? Number eight, prophesying according to the flesh. Prophesying according to the flesh. I'll talk about that on the school of ministry day I would have on September 16. Those of you who have spiritual gifts and you feel you have a ministry, you should be in that meeting. It's on a Monday morning. When they arrested Jesus, the soldiers blindfolded him and one of them slapped him and they said, sure you say you are a prophet. Tell us which of us slapped you. And guess what? Jesus said nothing. You know why? If Jesus responded to them, they want, you see, you don't test God. That will be him prophesying according to the flesh. When I mean prophesying according to the flesh, I mean guesswork. And there are people who are good in it. They are just guessing. Last week, I told you to prophesy on each other. Do you remember? And I did say that, oh, thank you for that, just leave it there. And I did say that every Christian can prophesy. But not every Christian is called into the office of a prophet. Leave that story for September 16th. Are you there? Did you notice that before I asked you to prophesy on each other, I first told you to speak in tongues? Who was in church last week? Now, now, do you know why? When you speak in tongues, and then later you begin to pray in your understanding in English, what you are saying is the interpretation of the tongues you have been speaking. And tongues plus its interpretation equal to prophecy. You didn't hear me? Tongues plus its interpretation equals to prophecy. So if I speak in tongues for a while, pray on an issue in tongues, 
And then I begin to interpret and say in my understanding, all right, so that person, that situation, I am prophesying. My point now is, you cannot accurately prophesy on someone or on people that you have not interceded for. If I did not pray for this service before coming here this Sunday morning and pray about some things, I will not accurately say somebody here this week, if I'm doing that, it would just be guesswork in the flesh. Prophecy is an inspired word over a situation, over a person that you have prayed in the Holy Ghost about. But what we see is that, you know, someone is in Benin, and you say, ah, there is somebody here, your name is Osas. Everyone in Benin is Osas. There are many Osas here. Now, whether that is according to the flesh or according to the spirit depends on what that person prophesying has done before holding the microphone. I guess what I'm saying. And the truth of the matter is, where there are 2,000 people gathered, what do Nigerians want? Where there are 2,000 people gathered, someone must be looking for the fruit of the womb. Someone must be looking for a job. Someone must be looking for, oh, I forgot, visa, that should come first. And then, for most others, they are looking for a husband. I don't know why you don't say wife. Okay? Now, these are the basic things, and of course, everybody is looking for money. Are you seeing? Now, it doesn't mean the prophecy is wrong, but a lot are according to the flesh. Because the person is just permutating. And we have seen a couple of them. The way algorithms of social media work. Are you with me? I'm coming to a camera road for a crusade. Facebook can bring me all the people around that area. And I say, ah, there is somebody here. Your name is, 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 I want to call you that. Your name is Tutu. Your number is 00234. And the person, oh my God. Your mother is sick. Ah. And you forgot that two days ago you posted on Facebook, pray for my mother. Are you seeing? Those things are God with him. The one that is by the spirits of God there will be an agreement with your spirit because you have the spirit of God. That's why you see, oh my. So when you see people who are selling all sorts now, selling soap, selling lights, and then all manner of um, rituals that they are doing now, the multitude who are listening to them or who are buying those things, they don't know God. They, they, they don't have an idea of Christianity. They, are, they don't have the spirits of God. You know why? If you have the spirits of God, your spirits will agree with something on the outside. Are you with me? When there, one day, one day, some years ago, I've forgotten the year, right? And, and you know, the way these things work, I had prayed to God January 1st for financial breakthrough. Financial breakthrough. January 3rd, I wanted to sell a phone that is not so valuable. It's even bad. Somebody helped me on an app and got a buyer and went to meet the buyer somewhere at the junction and brought minty notes, shiny notes. And I was like, oh my God, the prayer has even started. It's a bondu. I was so impressed. And I told my brother, let's go to the market. We went to go and buy things in the market. And as we were moving, there was a crowd following us and discussing. We didn't know if they were coming for us. Right? So I was hearing a bulky people say, Naim, no be him. And they just got at us. Say, ah, you, you buy something with fake money. Ah. So my bundle was fake. I say it cannot be. Because I had bought it from, bought something from someone else before we same notes. And the person didn't say anything. Say it was fake. You know what? We entered the nearest bank. And as soon as the person on the counter just touched it, the person said it's fake. He just moved on. Uh -uh. 
I said, oh God, will you not even check, do like this? He said, we have been trained to always touch original. He said, they never let us touch fake. We always touch original, such that the day we encounter fake, just by one search, we will know it's fake. What does that tell me? If I have original spirits of God in me, the day I encounter fake prophets, just by one word, I will know is fake. Many of them are just content creators. They are trying to keep you busy. And a few others are also in very direct communication with demonic spirits. Are you with me? You know, I was telling someone this morning about a particular influencer who is dragging another popular fake prophet. I don't know any name, oh, please don't call any name yet. So I was saying, I said, do you know this influencer can actually die? You know why? He is not spiritual enough. Of course, we know this man is fake, but this man is also demonic. All right? They can kill the influencer in their coven. Finished. It will now even further validate like their power is real because the majority are blind. May God give you understanding. Number how many now? I've said nine, I want to say nine. I want to say nine. I can't see where I wrote it again. No. Okay. Number nine. I said this one last week. Trying to test God. Trying to test God. That was what Satan did in Matthew 4. If... Thou be the Son of God. Command this stone to turn towards. Jesus never answers to Eve. Just a second, please. I'm looking for a scripture. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Good, that's it. Go down to verse 16. 16, please. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are ye to whom ye obey. Satan told Jesus, especially when Jesus was hungry, if thou be the son of God, command this stone to turn to bread. Jesus had every reason to turn stone to bread. He was hungry, but if he had done it, he had just obeyed Satan. And know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey... His servants are ye to whom you obey. So if he had turned stone to bread, he has automatically become the servant of Satan. Because he had just obeyed Satan. Are you seeing? That's why God never answers to if you can't tempt God. You can't tempt God. You cannot say if you are, do this for me. If you know you are God, do this for me. One guy got so frustrated in his prayer, he said to God, Say, God, if to say, I may be God, I'll further help you by now. <laughs> I can imagine the pain. Now, 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 the kind of God we serve will not get angry. He will just smile at him, not see boy. He will grow up. What he does know is that God has helped him already. Are you seeing? So, but when we are in desperate situations, God does not have to prove himself that he is God. God cannot say, come, let me show you I'm God. Are you with me? God does not prove himself. The chapter before then, God had already told Jesus, thou art my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now Satan is coming to say, if thou art the son of God. 
If Jesus had tried to prove, that means Jesus had not yet understood the fact that he was the son of God. Same, same exact strategy that Adam and Eve failed. Satan told them, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. And they were already made in the image and likeness of God. Anytime you are trying to prove something to Satan, he has won you. Listen, Christians are not the ones trying to win Satan. Satan knows you've already won. When you are trying to win Satan, it means that you don't even know that you have now been made more than a conqueror. Meaning, if there is a winner, you are beyond the winner. But you are trying to win. That's reducing yourself. That's why many times Jesus ignored Satan or answered him with the word, the word of God. Most of the time, when the enemy throws things at you, answer with the word of God. But if you're not answering with the word of God, ignore him. That silence is powerful. What that means is, I am not giving credibility to what you are doing. Ignoring him means, I don't really send you. You get what I'm saying? I have three more minutes. Lastly, number 10, expecting Jesus to assume. Games Christians play with God. Expecting Jesus to assume. It happened all through the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You will see a blind man who shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus will come close. Jesus is not blind. Jesus can see that this man is blind. Yet Jesus will ask, what will you that I do for you? Are you seeing? Jesus is seeing a man who is crippled, bedridden on the pool of Bethesda. He's asking the man, who will you be made whole? As in, do you want to be healed? Jesus never assumes. Not everyone who is sick wants to be healed. Go to a ring road. Some wants, the sickness is their business. Are you with me? You don't assume they want healing. Maybe they just want money. So Jesus will ask, do you want to be made whole? He does not assume. When someone comes to me and tells me something, expecting me to counsel them, I always ask them, do you want to hear my opinion? Do you want me to talk to you about this? I, you just, it might just be that you want someone who will listen to you. So I don't assume that you are here because you appreciate my intelligence or something like that. So because you are taking my time, I will clarify, I will ask. Are you seeing? You don't assume. If you want 100,000, pray to Jesus and say, give me 100,000. Don't say, bless me. Why? You are already blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly in Christ Jesus. If you need 50,000, tell him you need 50,000. Don't assume. Don't expect him to assume. Don't just vaguely say, bless me, as if you are not blessed. Don't just vaguely say, favor me. You are favored in Christ Jesus. Tell him directly what you want. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayers and thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. God does not know what some of you want. Why? He chooses not to assume. You've been praying, bless me, bless me, bless me. And he said, ah, but you're already blessed. So just say, I want 5,000. And then learn how to receive the gifts that God gives. They don't spend night in heaven, I hope you know. If someone abroad wants to give to you, they will give to you in their own currency, isn't it? So if God wants to give to you, he will give to you in his own currency. So you must know how to convert his own currency to Naira. Faith is the exchange. So, so when you pray, you must be specific, and then you must be taught how to appropriate God's answers. That's a totally different message. 
Are you following what I'm saying? You must be specific in prayers. Don't say favor me. You are favored in Christ Jesus. You don't need anything extra to be favored. Just tell him what you want. Don't assume. Don't assume. Don't expect that he knows everything. God knows everything, but he wants to hear the specifics from you. Was it not the same God who will tell them in the Bible, he will say, put me in remembrance? Do you think he forgets? He does not forget. Why will he ask you to remind him? Are you with me? Prayer is an official dialogue. When you come, you present your case. Nobody goes to the court, um, 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 the court room and tells the judge, you know, bless me. Or you go to the court room and you tell the judge, I know one die. What does that mean? Your counsel must explain that someone has accused you of so and so and so and you, they are sentencing you to jail. Even though it's written there in the book that the judge has before him. He must hear it from your own counsel. Am I correct? Prayer is a legal word. So when you go to God, you tell him specifically. And then you back it up with a constitution, which is his word. Are you with me? You say, you, you, you say in your word that if earthly fathers good, give good gifts to their children, how much more you are a heavenly father? And then you ask specifically, and then when you do, thank him like you have received it. That ends the process. Are you seeing and then you keep believing. People don't know God answers prayer, so they think we're just doing church. And it's because they've not been well taught on the dynamics of the same. But we'll see that in the days to come. Rise to your feet. The aim of this is this. Are you... Having faith, or are you just playing games with God? Many things that people are just doing, they think they have faith in God, they think they are exercising their faith in God, but they are playing games with God. Because what they are doing is not a New Testament scriptural principle. Remember, these things are written for our words, learning. So when you read things in the Old Testament, you must rightly appropriate it. Are you with me? You must rightly divide the word of truth. Is it possible that while I was teaching, you caught yourself in one of what I called games Christians play with God? Maybe one of them, you have been doing it, but you didn't know you've been playing games. Are you seeing? So the prayer you are praying now is a reappropriation. If you have been telling God, give me a child and I will give you so and so amount. Now, pray a more correct New Testament prayer. I know that I am blessed. I know that the fruit of my body is blessed. Are you seeing? You are appropriate the right things. So I'm giving you 10 seconds to open your mouth and reappropriate anything that you have wrongly appropriated to yourself, thinking you were doing the right thing. There are 8 billion Christians on the surface of the earth. This morning, over 3 billion Christians are in churches all over the world. And yet, it seems like we are not making progress. Much of what we know as Christianity is just us playing games with God. We don't read our Bible ourselves. We are doing what we have been told. We are doing what we have seen other people do. I want you to reappropriate all those things. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Christianity is not meant to be one hard life. Christ, listen, Christ, oh my. Christianity is not supposed to be a battle from one issue to the other. And you keep on waiting on God forever. He has done it all in Christ Jesus. It will come in time. Okay, now you have 30 more seconds. If you are praying... Just take that 30 seconds. 